I love you. There you go. I love you. God, I love you, Lord, for today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. And so I'll praise you. I'll lift you up and I'll magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. With praise. Here we go, John. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. And so I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. Oh, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Yes, yes. Amen. Since we are doing, since we are doing uh, our week of fasting, I wanted to review a subject that we've talked about before, uh, but I wanted to, rather than just give you in terms of instructional um, or in terms of options, I wanted to get into some of the spiritual reasons why we fast and what it means. Now, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we are going to... Uh, let you kind of follow along with my notes. Um, I believe it's helpful for uh, all of us to not just hear, but to see. And I think sometimes re uh, retention is increased when we actually do that. So the question is this, why do we fast and why is fasting a spiritual activity in the same manner that prayer is? Think about that. Fasting is a spiritual activity in the same manner that prayer is a, a spiritual activity. Um, Anthony, are you are you on are you on the call here? Yeah. Uh, um, Anthony gave me a testimony about how uh, fasting kind of worked in his life. Real quick, share that testimony uh, with the room that 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 you shared with me earlier. Um. Well, at least twice um, with the same sister, I um, felt really strongly that I, I needed to pray and. And so I would start to pray and then I felt no prayers, not, you know, not, not quite enough prayer you need to fast for. And each time that I, I fasted for her, the first time I fasted and while I was fasting for her, she called me and asked me some questions about church and stuff because she was considering going to church and starting to go to church and stuff. And then it was uh, probably a, a, a good few months later, six months or so later, I felt that same way where I, I needed to fast prayer wasn't quite enough and I was fasting for her, and she called me on the Sunday right after I had broke that fast and told me that she had went to church and got filled with the Holy Ghost that's a great great testimony because it shows fasting in a very similar way to you see it in the scripture where a breakthrough of some type is needed um, the breakthrough can be a battle within ourselves a breakthrough can be in a, a spiritual a mission or a call or a need uh, and fasting can also be very much uh, a part of breaking through for other people. Um, we're going to talk about Jesus fasting later on, but I just want to remind you that Jesus was sinless. He had committed no sin. There was no fault in him. And what did he do? He went on a 40 day fast at the beginning of his ministry. This seems to at odds uh, with, with, how oftentimes I've thought about fasting. Um, I know why as a person that is always tempted toward carnality, I know why I need to fast. Um, as people that are wrestling with the flesh, we know why we need to fast. But here's Jesus, 40 days at the beginning of his ministry, he is fasting and he is without sin. Think about that. So I want to talk a few uh, along this line of fasting and why we do it. Um, the first thing I want you to consider is what we laughingly refer to as a food coma. Um, if you've ever had a holiday where you ate everything, <laughs> you had at the end of that a food coma. 
and it's a joke. I don't know if that's a real medical term or not. I don't think it is, but it just, you've overeaten too much sugar and all you're really good for is, is a nap. It's like, you can't get up and walk around. Your senses are lowered. Your, your mental acuity is fogged. And the only thing is good for you is to take a nap. Now I know some of you guys, not all of you, but most of you know exactly what I'm talking about, about a food coma. I found, I found a, a meme online that shows it. I think they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, well, here we go. Um, this is a picture of a puppy <laughs> after the puppy's eaten too much and the puppy falls asleep in the bowl. And uh, of course the funny quote passing out after a cheap meal, like, and the puppy's asleep in the bowl. Here's another one. Same idea. I like this one. Food coma. I has it. <laughs> Puppies laying over about to pass out in the in the food, the food bowl. Um, we're 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 comfortable with the idea of food dulling our senses. We're comfortable with the idea of food putting us to sleep. Uh, we're comfortable with the idea of of the food coma dulling our senses and our alertness. Now, with that image in mind, I want you to take a step back from just food. And I want you to consider yourself as a complete individual, a whole man, a whole woman that God created you to be. That means um, you are body, soul, and spirit. You are unique spirit. That's your personality, uh, how you have experienced, how you have overcome, how you have thought about things, uh, the uniqueness of you, your human spirit. Uh, you are also unique flesh. Um, even if you have a twin, uh, they're not exactly like you. So you are this combination of unique spirit, your personality, the uniqueness of you, and you are a combination of unique flesh. And uh, here's what's interesting. Uh, now make that eternal. Make that eternal. And now we start talking about the whole, the whole man, the whole woman um, trying to, as it were, not just live here in this world, but to live spiritually connected to uh, the kingdom of God. So we think of ourselves as mind. We think of ourselves as body. We think of ourselves as spirit. And even though, and I want you all to be aware of this because biblically this is emphasized. A lot of the church world doesn't emphasize this as much. Um, in the future, we're still going to be mind, body, and spirit. The difference is we're going to be given a new body. That's the distinction. You were created mind, body, and spirit, and you will always be mind, body, and spirit. It's just in the future. You will be given a new body, a new body, still the uniqueness of you, still the uniqueness of your personality how you've experienced things, how you've overcome things, your personality made eternal with a new body. So with that in mind, if we're thinking about, we're thinking holistically, as it were, about a man or a woman, uh, us individually, uh, not just mind, not just body, but holistically mind, body, and spirit, uh, we would say this, the body, the flesh is obvious to our senses. You know, our senses, our five senses of tasting, hearing, seeing, uh, you get the idea. These senses, the body is obvious to that. And your mind is obvious to your experiences. So you as a created being, your mind is perhaps the most real thing you know. In fact, the famous philosopher Rene Descartes, uh, said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, you could also, you know, you could uh, spin that around and you could say, I am, therefore I think, but I have known many people who were there, but didn't think that's a joke. We're moving along. <laughs> and so uh, here you are, mind and body. Your mind is the most, as a being, your mind is the most obvious thing to you of anything you're experience, you can experience. Um, the philosopher's point, Descartes' point, was that even if I was being deceived by a malevolent power in my mind would be where I was being deceived. Even if this malevolent force was deceiving me, it would still happen in my thoughts. 
And therefore the philosopher said, because I think, even if it was deception, that's how it would happen. I, I, I think, therefore I am. So your mind represents the, I would say, the uniqueness of your human spirit. And you experience that, but your mind is not obvious to other people. Other people don't see your mind. What they see is your body. And so the very existence of this deep, rich inner world that we have and other people's inability to perceive our rich inner world in its own way is a testimony of the spirit realm. And so when someone says, if I cannot see it or touch it, I don't believe in it. Well, how do you know uh, that a person exists inside a body? You see it moving. You see, this is every person you meet is like a testimony of the dual reality of our world, the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. As believers, this isn't hard for you because you are all quite comfortable with the uh, living your life as flesh and spirit. Um, so your body's obvious to your senses and to other people's senses. Your mind, however, is the most obvious thing in the world to you, but other people without talking to you or listening to you, all they have is an opinion. They cannot experience your spirit. They cannot experience your spirit. They can talk to you, they can hear your stories, but you are the living, walking testimony of the spirit realm, even when you're surrounded by, by unbelievers. Now, that's a little bit of a kind of a, a deep waters, and I don't mean to wade off into them, but I, I want to make a point to say, every time you wonder about the spirit world, recognize that the very fact that no one can experience you teaches us the reality of the flesh and the spirit. And so our mind is obvious to our experience, uh, but not to other people. They have their own experiences. However, we see each other in the flesh, but the flesh is going to be what passes away. And that is going to be what is made new. So out of our uniqueness, out of our individuality, emerges this blending of mind and body and spirit out of the uniqueness of you, what you've overcome. I actually preached about this a little bit Sunday, how you have learned what your gifts are. This unique being emerges and that person who you choose to be, that life you choose to live is always at risk of serving the flesh, pleasing the flesh, overvaluing the flesh. This is as old as the story of humanity where we wrestle not to be carnally founded people, but to be spiritually founded people. Uh, even when we're trying to be spiritually spiritual people, if we're not careful, the temptation of the flesh is always reestablishing our foundations upon carnal things not on spiritual things. And so the word of God comes along and tells you, tells me, you're more than a body. You are unique. You're God's child. God breathes into you. You are a living witness of his creative genius. And you in his image are like him in enough of a way to testify of who he is and what he wants to do through you. The Bible comes along. The word of God comes along. The spirit of the Lord comes along and tells you you're not just a unique body and mind. You are unique body and mind who's going to live forever. You are body, soul, and spirit. The Lord will not debate you over this. Um, if you don't want to see the spiritual side of life, the Lord won't debate you over it. The Lord won't argue with you over it. The Lord won't drag you kicking and screaming into spirituality. And we all confess that we need help building our life on spiritual foundations, not just vacations and weekends and uh, fun things for the flesh, the life of pleasure. We need help building on foundation. So the Lord has created all of these things to help us live spiritually. These things include the word of God, these things include spiritual disciplines, prayer and fasting. These things include the mission that is the direct path in front of your gifts and calling. 
when God calls you and gifts you, you just have to start walking and the calling will pull you into spiritual intentionality, spiritual mission. You will begin to make a difference. We are challenged by the word of God and by the spirit of God, even the voice of God to live as spiritual people, not carnal people, spiritual people. I think the story of Abraham is the quintessential example of this. A voice speaks to Abraham, asks him if he can believe in the promise of God. Abraham doesn't even know the name of God. He doesn't even have a title of God. That doesn't come until later when he meets Melchizedek. But he's asked if he can believe. And Abraham looks into his heart and he decides, yes, I can believe. And this is what we answer in our spirit on a regular basis. Can we believe? Can I live as a believer? Or am I always pulled back to build on the temporal, uh, upon flesh, upon pleasure, upon experience? The word of God, the voice of God, the promise of God invites all of us to perceive the spiritual foundations of life. And some believe and some don't believe. Um, you say that's about as simple as you can get. Thank you very much. Um, we don't help anybody by trying to force them to believe. Not everybody uh, believes. The Lord says that when he returns, he's looking for faith. Will he find faith? If you believe, if you believe that you are more than body and mind, if you believe that mind is eternal and body will be made new, you're now ready to live as body, soul, and spirit. Yes, the body will be made new. The mind, the uniqueness of you represents your spirit, and it will live forever in a new vessel that God gives you. Um, if you're going to believe that, then all of a sudden it becomes very important for you to begin to believe, or, or let me say that different. It becomes very important for you to, to begin to live in such a way where you make a distinction between carnal and spiritual, because these two worlds are at opposites. Uh, carnal and spiritual are at odds one with another. There is a direct inverse, which means opposite, inverse relationship between flesh and spirit. And the daily battle of the believer is to turn away from flesh and embrace spirit. The daily battle for the believer is to turn away from pleasure, experience, flesh, and turn toward spirit, purpose, calling, eternity. If a workplace has somebody working there who every day is turning away from flesh and seeking to be spiritual, that individual is a blessing to that workplace. You guys are, should be that individual in your life. You may work in a hospital. If there's one person on that hospital floor who every day is turning away from flesh and seeking to build upon spiritual, he or she is a blessing to that hospital floor. In your family, in your grouping of friends, if there's one person in that group who is every day by the intentionality of their mind and spirit turning away from the things of the flesh and asking what God would speak into this moment, what God would say about this family member going through discouragement, what God would say about that coworker going through a divorce, what God would say to that uh, cousin who is dealing with alcoholism or drug addiction. You become a blessing in your ability to see the eternal, the spiritual, the missional, the godly, in a world that is blind to these things and only sees the carnal. Yes, they understand body and flesh. And yes, they understand mind and experience, but they fail to see how we are eternal beings and we choose an eternal way of life rather than just building upon the sand of the flesh. This is such an important principle, turning away from the flesh, turning away from physical and turning towards spiritual, that fasting, literally not eating, <laughs> takes on a spiritual component. Uh, in the Old Testament, fasting was a way of expressing grief 
and humbling oneself before God. In the Old Testament, we don't preach this much nowadays, but it's in the Old Testament. They fasted as part of repentance. Um, I don't know if it'd be a good church growth idea, but what if someone came to the altar and we asked them, all right, you ready to repent of your sins? Yep. All right. Three days with only water. I don't know if that would work or not, but that was a very Old Testament way of expressing grief and humbling oneself before the Lord. David, Psalms 35, 13, he humbles himself, the Bible says, how? With fasting. Now in the New Testament, fasting is shown as a way to draw closer, to draw closer to God. And you see this, I think, in the most powerful way, as I mentioned earlier, when Jesus, who has no sin, goes into the wilderness and fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he is tempted. Afterward, he is offered everything that he wants the world to save the world. That's why he's going to go to the cross, but he's going to do it without sacrifice. Satan lies to him and says, I can give it to you. Satan's always going to tell you he can give you something he can't give you. If he did it to Jesus, I promise he's going to do it to you. Um, Satan is the salesman who sells things he doesn't own. He'll tell you he'll make you happy. He, he doesn't have happiness. He wanders to and fro on the earth. He's not happy. He'll tell you that he has wealth. He'll give you the kind of wealth that doesn't mean anything on your deathbed. There's a better kind of wealth than that. Uh, Satan's always in the business of selling something he doesn't have. And he tried to sell Jesus, the world, when he had it not to give. If Jesus, without sin, felt need to draw near to the calling, the realm of the spirit, his father, flesh and spirit, how much more should we sinners, how much more should we desire to, to, to embrace the calling of God and draw nigh unto, unto the Lord? Um, in the New Testament, fasting and prayer always, almost always are mentioned together. In fact, I can't remember any time. I haven't looked specifically, but I, I can't remember a time in the New Testament where they're not mentioned together. Acts 13, uh, the church fasted and prayed together. Luke chapter number two, verse number 37, a widow worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. Um, I want to give you five ways that fasting changes us, but I want you to know fasting can have broad reaching spiritual effects. I wanted Anthony to share that because he actually moved with a burden for his sister added fasting to prayer and experienced the testimony of breakthrough in, in her life. Fat, the effects of fasting are, bro are as broad as your mission are. The effects of fasting are as broad as the first church calling is. The effects of fasting is as broad as there is uh, the desire of heaven to be worked, revealed, manifest here on earth. Um, but the manner in which fasting changes us and prepares us as tools in the hand of God. Let me give you five. This isn't a total list, but it's pretty close. <laughs> There's a few, maybe a handful of others, but we're getting the bigger part of it. Um, number one, this is, I think, the single most underemphasized um, element of fasting in our life. Fasting, along with prayer, orders our soul. It spiritually organizes our values and our desires. If you are in a fight with your flesh, you're not going to win without fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer organizes your soul. Uh, if you are calloused, you will find fasting and prayer softens your calloused heart. Uh, one of the things that has happened to me every time I've gone on uh, any fast longer than three three days is that somewhere uh, between about day five and day seven, my spirit is broken within me. And in the presence of the Lord, I find just a, uh, almost just a, a brokenness in the presence, in the presence of the Lord. Uh, it is as though the fasting by saying no to my lusts, it orders my soul. It spiritually organizes my values and my desires. Um, if any of you are fighting a strong battle with a specific temptation, um, I want to encourage you to go on a fast. 
Um, I promise you, fasting will break the yoke of bondage in your life. If you're dealing with a specific type of sin that you can't seem to get a, a victory over, I want to encourage you to fast. Fasting, along with prayer, will break the yoke of that in your life because it organizes your values and your desires. Secondly, fasting increases your spiritual sensitivity. Um, I promise you, it is as though you someone turns up the volume spiritually in your life when you fast because you are able to have a focus upon spiritual things that you will not experience uh, when you have food coma <laughs> and you are laying over taking your spiritual nap. <laughs> I promise you fasting will vastly increase your spiritual sensitivity. A lot of people I have found that's not enough motivation for them. Um, it's hard for them to get motivated to increase. My goal is to increase my spiritual sensitivity. What they need is a specific burden. So they can fast for a loved one. They can fast for a ministry. They can fast for an individual. They can fast because as long as the mission has a face, then they can fast. Um, I'm totally sympathetic to that. I completely understand um, specific prayers activate your faith in a way that vague prayers never will specific goals and fasting activate in a way that just a vague goal never will. So it's not wrong. Um, but I promise you, if you have a need and you need to be spiritually sensitive, go on a fast, it will make a difference in your life. Number three, fasting humbles the carnal nature, spirit, attitude within. Um, the biggest risk for the strong believer is vanity. I, I, I will say that uh, from any pulpit in America, the single biggest risk for the strong believer is vanity. Um, the people who they pray, uh, they pray so much they're proud of it and want to tell you their biggest risk is vanity. The person who fasts until their belly button falls off, <laughs> um, their biggest risk is vanity. Um, this is why Jesus specifically told Pharisees, when you pray, don't make an announcement. And when you fast, don't put sackcloth and ashes on your head to let everyone, everybody know you're suffering. Because fasting, you cannot starve the carnal nature and feed the carnal nature at the same time. And that's what you do when you use fasting as vanity statements. You're trying to discipline the vain nature and starve the vain nature and it does not work. It creates spiritual dissonance. And the only thing way out of that spiritual dissonance is to turn away from humbling God and turn to exalting self. But now you use your piety. That's the misuse of fasting. And Jesus mentions it several times um, in, in the gospels, uh, correcting Pharisees. Number four, fasting along with prayer reveals our hidden motives. Um, if you're seeking something and you're worried that it may not be the will of God, prayer and fasting will give you insight to your hidden motives. This is important because without truth, we never are free to spiritually become. We're telling ourselves a lie. We're living a lie and we are trapped in that lie. Fasting and prayer reveals our hidden motives. And finally, number five, Fasting builds faith. Um, fasting, because it orders your soul, because it increases your spiritual sensitivity, because it humbles the carnal nature within, and because it reveals truth to you about yourself and the repentance you need to pray. It builds tremendous faith in the life of the believer. It builds tremendous faith in the church body. Fasting prepares people to believe for things they would not have been able to believe before because they were not at a place of spiritual ascendance. Fasting by cutting away the undergrowth, the distractions in their life, increase their faith. And what do we know biblically? There's a direct result between the what we can receive from God and our faith that we have in God. In fact, 
uh, at least one place, and there's more than this, but you'll remember this verse where Jesus says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. And so those are five ways in which fasting changes us. And the last thing I want to point out here, and I think this is super important, is that fasting teaches us about the daily battle against temptation that we live in our life. Fasting teaches us the reality of the daily battle in our life. Now, why do I think that's so important? Well, the reason why I think it's so important is because I've learned this about fasting. No matter how many times I've gone on a fast, the next fast doesn't get easier. Um, I'm just going to let that settle here for a minute. No matter how many times I've fasted, if I start a fast today, it doesn't get easier. So is the battle against the flesh. Those of you who have an ongoing battle against the flesh, um, every day it's going to feel you're choosing again to be a spiritual person. I think the Apostle Paul was the most blunt about this when he likened um, his struggle uh, to almost a crucifixion um, where I am choosing every day. So I want to encourage you, if you're serving the Lord, you're not alone. Everybody who's trying to get this right is turning away from the flesh and they're choosing the kingdom of God. And I want to appeal to every one of you, let's do this. Let's live this way. You can make a difference. You can turn away from the flesh. You can believe the promises of God. You're not alone. When you make time to pray, you're not alone. Everybody in the whole world who's trying to live spiritually, they had to make time to pray. When you seek to be a voice of hope in a workplace where there's not a lot of faith, I want to tell you, you're not alone. Every believer all around the world, you see, there is no place of arrival where I don't have to choose anymore. There's no place where I, you know, I, I'm... When I fast nowadays, I no longer get hungry. I've never never met anybody who said, you know, I fasted so much I no longer get hungry. I want to meet that person because then I want to slap them. <laughs> um, I want, of course, it would be great if we got beyond that. But that's, um, we're still body, soul, and spirit. And so as believers, we set aside time. We set aside seasons where we are, we decide to fast and we decide to pray. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, if any of you, I don't know if this is the type of subject that, that spins off many questions. Um, if any of you have any questions, um, you can, you can uh, put them in the chat room um, and I'll give a moment. I'll give you a moment to do that. If we don't have questions, um, then, uh, I will, you know, I'll just, we'll just pray together um, and I will uh, let you get to your, get to your, the rest of your evening. Um, but let's just give a moment here. Um, if there's any questions that are being typed into the, the text box right now. Mala, uh, uh, Nathan, why don't you give us some keys here and we'll uh, sing again and I give them a moment to, um, if they want to. Okay, that's a good, and thank you for that, Anthony. That's a very good question. What's the an appropriate age to start fasting? Um, so what I would say about that is if we open the box of what fasting is, it's almost never too early to start fasting. Um, but if uh, you are talking about no food, um, I think there's better things for kids to do um, than no food. That's my personal opinion. Um, I think you would ask a child, you know, to give something up that they like, like say they like orange juice in the morning, you know, uh, you, you have them give that up for a time. Um, I can, I think that can be helpful. I do think that we should, we should take care um, when we, to, to just have a child have no food, because I'll tell you why. Um, we don't want to set them up for failure. Um, I would not let my child uh, ask for a th to, to go on a 
two or three day fast unless they were surprisingly mature and surprisingly committed to it because I don't want to set them up for failure. Um, I don't want them to have a sense of defeat. And so I would, as a parent, I would set the goal to what I think they could do, what would represent a good step for them. And I would ask them to do that. Um, I think that's the way to deal with, with children um, uh, that are interested. I, I did my first three day fast before I was a teenager. Um, we were in revival at our church, um, but I have a conf- I have a confession to make. Um, on the second day, I started cheating. I just didn't tell my mom and dad. Um, <laughs> um, it was I was a little guy. I was running and playing. It was hard, and they weren't forcing me to do it. I had they let me do it, um, but I felt so much guilt during that time, uh, as I should, um, and. Um, you know, I, for a while there, I was sure the rapture is going to take place and I was going to be left. Um, it would be my choice not to set a child up for failure. What would be something that would be good for them and then have them do that? Um, that I think that is as good an answer as I can make on that. Um, I'll see it as, as far as fasting at work. When I, when I fast, I just fast. I can be at home, I can be at work. Um, I do think you have to take care not to put yourself in a situation where you're at risks. Say you're operating uh, heavy equipment. You don't want to have low blood sugar operating heavy equipment. No. Oh, I nearly passed out. That wouldn't be good. Um, so um, I, I do think that it is, it's appropriate to do that. All of you who work in a manual type or in, a, in heat, um, I want to encourage you to find a way to fast where you are suffering. <laughs> Your flesh is paying the price but you're not putting yourself at risk with uh, equipment. Um, example would be, uh, I've gone on multiple, no, I call no pleasant bread fasts. I'd have no protein, no bread. I only would have vegetables, no salad dressing, only vegetables. I could have as many vegetables I wanted, but you learn something after the second day, vegetables are just not hitting the spot and you begin to suffer. <laughs> you would kill you can smell bread from three miles away you drive by bojangles and every biscuit in there slaps you on the face as you go by you guys know this um but if you're working in the heat you're working in the sun um i i i think there's a lot to be said for trying to take the braggability out of a fast there's certain kind of fasts that are very braggable you know I fasted 40 days and 40 nights and didn't even drink water. Well, you're still here. So something happened. Maybe it was drinking something else. I don't know. Um, So um, I don't make any distinction between work or home and fasting. As far as prayer, yes, I think fasting without prayer halves its effectiveness. Um, But one thing you'll find out if you're fasting, it'll change your prayer. And any of you guys have been on long fast, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you go on a fast, it will change your prayer. Um, you'll be you'll you'll be much closer to intercession on a long fast. I've been on long fasts, and I've been in. I've gone into a prayer rooms and a fast, and I never said a single thing to God. I I I, I had intercession move on me, and I went into tongues coming into the prayer room and I spent the whole time in tongues of prayer because I was in a fast and I just, I was moved in my spirit. I, I've had that happen to me. Fasting will change your prayer. Um, I would tell people if you're not going to pray, I wouldn't even fast. Just go on a diet. <laughs> I literally believe it's that much late. In fact, I would not call any fast without prayer a diet. Now I need to go on a diet <laughs> It'd be good for me to go on a diet, but I'm going to add prayer uh, to to that that thing. Um, so I want to emphasize the last this last thing. I, I dealt with a, a a man some time back who um, he came to me and he confessed that uh, he was dealing with a pornography addiction, and um, I this has been a few years back, and. Uh, he had talked about various stages of it. He was very honest, which I deeply respected. He wanted to be accountable, which I deeply respected. He was done trying to fix it himself, which I deeply respected. 
Um, and um, I asked him everything he had done. And he had gone through therapy. He had read books. And I asked him this question. I said, tell me about the fast you went on to break this oppression in your life. And um, he looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean fast? And I said, well, this is a lust of the flesh problem. And you have to order your soul. Your flesh has to learn that you want spiritual things more than fleshly things. You have to order your soul. And there's nothing that will order your soul faster than fasting and prayer. And so you need to send a message to your inner man. And you need to say, you're, you're over this. You're ready to move on. And so he did. He went on a he went on an extended fast and uh even when he needed to eat for work um he changed the fast to one meal a day um and he stayed at it and uh they they moved away so they're not with us anymore and the last time i talked to him because we had had that open accountability i knew he i i, I felt seriously that he would be honest with me because there was no reason to lie once they already know and I asked him what his experience of that had been. And uh, he told me that he felt like that extended fast broke the back of that addiction in his life in a way that counseling had never broken, that reading books had never broken. Fasting organizes your soul. It organizes my soul. And so I want to encourage all of you this week where we are fasting and praying. Um, let's be let's let's be intentional. Um, with setting aside something. Uh, there's many different types of fasts, as you know. Um, one meal a day is a tough fast. I did it. I've done that twice for about 40 days. Where I did one meal a day twice for 40 days. Um, two different Nathan. times. Um, hey. Yeah. There are more questions. Oh, sorry. I may suggest for those who wish to fast but have to work to choose a fasting meal like crackers and bread, tea without sugar, honey, no protein or sugar. I think it's feasible for those who are not in a hypertension. Yes, absolutely. Um, is there a specific book of the Bible you would read during a fast? Um, I would, that's a good question. Um, I would associate the book I was reading with the breakthrough I was seeking. So I add fasting to prayer when I'm seeking a breakthrough and different books speak in different ways. Um, if I'm struggling with self mastery um, and remember, that's the first struggle of all believers is self mastery. If we don't have my self mastery, we really don't have any advice to give anybody else. The first battle for all of us is getting the self. -mastery. So if I was dealing with issues of self mastery, um, I might would, I might would spend time in the book of say Proverbs. Um, if I was dealing with oppression in my life, I might would spend time in the book of Psalms because Psalms better than any other book spreads human emotion through relationship with God and is really, really helpful. You recognize that you're not alone, that a lot of people have felt the way you have. You have. So I would, to answer that question, I would match the book I was reading with the breakthrough at which I was aiming my prayer and my and my fasting. Um, if I was uh, looking for a breakthrough in someone else's life, um, I might would pick one of the Gospels, or I might would pick um, even the Book of Acts and read in that, because in the Book of Acts, the power of God is transmitted to real people in the real, real world. It's not just you know people in a room celebrating with each other they're going to cities they're having breakthrough it's like uh, it's like not just mentioned it's a transmission that's what the book of acts is the power and the transmission and sometimes as church people we're really good at experiencing power but we're not good at transmitting it and so we get together we rev the engine rev the engine rev the engine but we never put it in gear the book of acts is putting the work the calling the power into gear and going somewhere with it and so i might would look at that that's a but that's a very um interesting question and you've got my mind uh churning on that now how to match books with uh, purposes in our mind so all right um i think that's enough i kept you guys a little too long last week so i'm going to kind of wrap it up here um i want to pray over you and uh i want us to prepare our hearts for sunday 
Um, and let's, let's, let's each of us, wherever you are, let's just take a moment, um, kind of focus our minds. Um, if you're driving, don't close your eyes, but <laughs> let's kind of gather our minds here uh, together. Lord Jesus, we very much want to be people of spiritual foundations. We very much want to be people building upon the eternal rock that is represented in your word, your promise, your word, your presence. Lord, I am praying today and I'm desiring today that as a church, uh, we would take up with deep seriousness, we would take up the burden of being a spiritual testimony to our world. We would take up the responsibility of speaking faith in workplaces where there's not much faith. We would take up the responsibility of speaking hope in family and friend situations where people are trying to solve all their problems themselves. And if we can't do that, Lord, or we are too spiritually lazy, we're in a type of carnal food coma where we are no spiritual sensitivity, we're at sleep in Zion, all we're good for is to slump over and take a nap. We need to go on a fast, Lord. And we need to be awoken to the spiritual potential that exists, a spiritual opportunity that exists for people who would build their lives upon the promises of God. And they would stand upon the word of God. And they would speak that voice of heaven into a dusty wilderness, a desert. They would let the living water flow through them. Lord, we're not interested in just being labeled Christians. Labels very rarely help anybody. We want, if you would help us, to walk as spiritually sensitive people. That means we need to pray. That means we need, that means we need to fast. And with your strength, we can do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you all. God bless you. Have a great week. We will see you Sunday and find something in your life that you can offer unto the Lord in a fast. And let's join together Sunday. Have a great time. Take communion together. God bless you. We love you. We'll catch you later.